All right, let's just go over the homework and then I'll give the quiz. Um, so let's start, Leo. Uh, why is it important to have a validation set distinct from the training set? Um, since we train it on like the training set, uh -huh. um, we wouldn't want to test it on like, like a similar set. We want to test it totally like not correlated. related. Like related in any, in any fashion? Or like related in like that data was already like test like trained on. Okay, so. And what do we get from the validations? Um, just like, like a kind of general policy on how it would like, uh, on how it would go when you like ran on like other data. Yeah. So it tells you how how good you generalize, right? Uh, and in fact, let's say your training data has a low loss, and your validation data has a low loss. What would that mean? Or actually, let's say even training data is low loss and validation data is high loss. Um, then it's like probably the uh, training data is wrong. That could be. Well, let's actually come along to the next page and we'll get to fill, completely filling that in. So yeah, you want the validation set different from the training set because you want to see how well you generalize. And you can only generalize to stuff you've never seen before. Because if you generalize to stuff you've already seen, you might have memorized it in some sense. Yet, say you have a 10 degree polynomial to approximate some function. We don't know what the function is. With 10 or fewer distinct training examples, how well will the trained polynomial fit the training set? Assuming we've done good training. Uh, Ali? Um, it will be exact. We would expect it to be exact or extremely close. Right, everyone agree? Because we can fit any 10 training examples with a 10 degree polynomial, I guess assuming the x's are distinct. Right, if you have two x's with different y's, your polynomial can't capture that. But other than that, we should be able to exactly capture this. Um, because just as any two points define a line, any 10 points define a 10 degree polynomial. All right, so yes. We expect to do very well. How well will that trained polynomial, right, that same one, fit a validation set drawn from the same distribution, uh, Matt? Um, when you mean the same distribution, you mean the same? We can think of it, let's say, you grab a bunch of training examples, and then you say, OK, half of them are going to be test, half are going to be validation. I would say that it's going to be worse than the training set. Okay, because? Um, because, I guess, the, since we have, um, for part A, that it's exactly in that the, the model is kind of like a normal uh -huh. um, fit, and like any extra, it's, like, it's almost like overfitted, so like anything more would be any extra data. Okay, I would say in general, you're right. In general, I would expect that you do worse than training set because you've overfitted the data. However, let's say that these are your 10 points, and I'm carefully drawing them along a line. All right? A 10 degree polynomial might be, I don't know what this is, uh, y equals x plus 2, yeah. assuming this is 2, right? Now, our training data does have no error, right? But what would we get with our validation? Assuming it's drawn from the same distribution, which is just points along this line. It would be exactly the same. So, could it be better? Oh, no, it can't be better. In fact, here, if we have high, don't normally put high below low, we put high here and low here. So we would never expect to see high training loss. Training loss. High training loss and low validation loss. Right? There's just no reason that we would expect that, except some you know, weird randomness doing the, based on how we had happened to sample the validation. So this is kind of impossible. Okay? 
So from this question, you could have ruled out we're never going to have validation loss better than the training loss. We're better, of course, we mean low in this case. But we could say it's about the same or worse or can't tell. More, it's going to be worse. It's only these very unusual circumstances where it's about the same. Sandy, there must be. There's a spot here. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I think this is the squatting spot. <laughs> Any questions on that one? Okay. And then, assume you have the same 10 degree polynomial. That is, our model is a 10 degree polynomial. We're going to determine what the coefficients are. And we have 10 to 6 or fewer. I don't know why I said fewer. I think I really need more. Uh, but we can answer it however you want. Uh, Santi, you're up. So, uh, how well do we think the training polynomial will fit the training set? I think it would do perfectly, that would do exactly. Because? Because you could just have everything set to zero except x. Something like the polynomial surface, if it's a, a function. Okay, so let's say I have 10,000 training examples uh, of, a quadra of a line. Right. That's the we'd expect we'd fit right. Yeah, because it would be white. Yeah, or if we had, you know, those are our examples, we could fit a, a, a quadratic to it, right? Yeah. Now you're saying any any function we can fit perfectly it would, with a 10 degree polynomial? It would have to be less than 10 degrees. But I, I guess that's what I was thinking. All right. Anyone else have a thought? No. Uh, so I think it would do fairly well since. Uh, Million points could be scattered uh, around in, in a, like a way that in which the function wouldn't look at all. Of them. All right, let me give you so, but you say you'd have low loss. I say yeah, the second one very low. All right, so let me give you a function, and we'll just sample some points from it. All right, uh, it's a not very good looking sign, uh, right? So I think that's equal sign. Are we going to be able to fit this with a polynomial? No, we're, we're not going to be able to fit it very well. We're going to have a loss um, no matter what we do with our 10 degree polynomial. Probably our best bet would just be to draw a line. It's a really poor sign x, right? It's translated and it's kind of, but you get the idea, right? So probably our best fit would be something like this. It's the best we could do, and that's not going to be very good. You had a question. I mean, can you use the pair of polynomial? Uh, so I'm just looking at a straight polynomial of x, right? And so with 10 degrees, we're not going to be able to, to fit this. <coughs> so what we need some richer representation, right? Like possibly a Taylor polynomial. So it depends on what the function is, right? If the function we're trying to approximate is itself, I mean, can be represented well by a 10 degree polynomial, then this will work fine. But if it won't, then it'll, it, it won't work well. So if we look at all functions, 10 degree polynomials don't do a good job of approximating them. If you only have 10 training sets though, 10 training set examples, it doesn't matter what the original function is, we can fit a polynomial perfectly too. So when you, when you talk about the original function, is that like, function to describe the distribution of the training examples? Because our because our training polynomial is, is supposed to be the training examples, right? Yeah, so what I'm assuming what I'm assuming yeah. what I'm assuming for the moment is that our training examples are coming from some distribution, which for the moment I'm assuming is a simple function. Right? It might be a function, you know, f of x equals sine x plus some uh, some R, which is some random, uh, you know, stochasticity. So it doesn't. So we could have different val values of x, which yield different values of y, possibly. But if we looked at that, we'd have kind of a, you know, something like that that we look at for our, for our sine x. Okay. In some cases, right, there is no underlying function that we're aware of. And many times in doing deep learning with neural networks, we're trying to approximate some function. We really have no idea exactly what it looks like. A good example would be uh, AlphaGo. Right? We have a neural network that, given a board configuration, will tell you the next place to play. 
What is that function that it is approximating? I have no idea, right? We don't know. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, how well with the, will the this trained polynomial do on the validation set? Uh, nice. Um, I think we should do about the same with the training set. Because we got so many training examples, we're not overfitting. Okay, and so therefore we would expect this to generalize well. If this did well, this will do well. If this does poorly, this will do about as poorly. It's not going to do worse. Sorry, the validation set's not going to do better, and we don't have any reason to think it'll do worse either. It should do about the same. So, in the case where we're trying to our, our training and validation data is coming from a sine x uh, function, we think this will do badly, right? High loss, and here we'll have the same high loss. So high loss and high loss, what does that represent? Underfitting. Underfitting, right? Basically, if your training loss is high, that <laughs> is underfitting. How can we solve that? we have to, to a ten degree polynomial isn't working for us, right? So either we're not training it well, we've got some problem in training, or our function that we are using for our approximation isn't powerful enough. And then we need to expand our possibilities, our universe of potential functions. Let me talk more about that. Uh, and where's overfitting on this chart? Uh, Brandon. Bottom right. So we've got low training loss and high validation loss, and this is overfitting. We don't know how to well. We know how to fix this by producing a richer model, right? How do we fix overfitting? Yeah. Uh, with a lesser model, with a training model, possibly training less. <laughs> Possibly a less rich model. Those are possibilities. Right. What's another way? We're adding more data. Train on, that's the example we saw here, which is what I was trying to show. We went from 10 to 10,000, and we all of a sudden are no longer overfitting. We may be underfitting, or we may not be. Done. And then this one? Uh, Mo, tell me about this quadrant. Um, that's the one, I guess that's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, this is nirvana, right? That's where we want our goal. Questions on this? All right, let's do the quiz. Okay, let's fill in just to review, right? How we are going to be training a function. So we have incoming an X and a Y, right? X is our input training example. And y is the label of that training example, the corresponding output of that training example. So this is sometimes called a label. And this is called supervised learning, where we're giving supervision. We're giving some input, and we're also saying, here's the correct answer for that. Here's some input, here's the correct answer for that as opposed to other types of learning where you maybe just say, here's a bunch of pictures, put them into categories for me. Right? And that would be unsupervised learning. But most of what we'll be doing is supervised learning. So we've got an X and a Y. This is, Susan, what in our diagram, what does this represent that X goes into? Function. Yes, the function which we'll call F. Right? So that's F. And it's parameterized, Raji, you wouldn't know because you weren't here, but let's just see by a Greek mathematical symbol, which is? OK, I'm very impressed. Theta, right? So theta is our parameterization of this function, right? So f comes from some universe of capital F, of possible functions, right? Or <coughs> I 
I guess what I want to say is actually something like this. F sub theta comes from some large set of F. Right? So we have our, our universe of um, possible parameterized functions. And this is a particular param parameterization of it. One of our big determinations is, what's this F going to be? What is our hypothesis space? That is, an hypothesis might be, it is a five degree polynomial. Okay? Or it might be that it's a combination of sine waves. Or it might be something else, that it can be represented with a neural network that's too deep with so many uh, neurons in it, or something like that. Okay? But that's one of the, the things that we need to determine. If we have a, a huge hypothesis space, lots of possible thetas, it's very easy to overfit. We've got lots and lots and lots of degrees of freedom, lots of thetas that we can choose, and lots of values for those thetas. So that's one of the decisions we're going to be making. But that's where this f comes from. We're determining, in some sense, the shape of the f, and the thetas are determining the actual uh, uh, nuts and bolts of it. Okay. And again, our polynomial, these are the coefficients. Uh, and what's coming out of f, uh, Jake? Um, so that, uh, some kind of output, what do we call it? Uh, yeah, it's like, let's say, a uh, Roman y hat. y hat is a great name for it. So, y hat. Distinguishing from y, because this is our estimate, and this is our known good value, right? Our, our, our uh, ground truth, we sometimes also call it. And that gets fed into uh, Daniel into what? Um, a loss function. A loss function, that's right. So now we get to say, how good is this theta actually for this x, given that this is the correct y? How close is this y hat to y? Who comes up with the loss function? Uh, we, do. we do. Another thing we get to choose. So we choose the loss function. So we choose this. We choose this. Uh, so this is us, us. Who chooses x and y? Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I guess whoever uh, whoever's looking at that. Yeah, it's a it's it's actually kind of a an interesting question. Like, is that our job? Is it someone else's job? Yeah. We we may get involved, right? Um, but in some sense, it's just input to us. Right. Uh, and then what about Ezra, this box? That's the optimizer. And it's the optimizer. And what is it optimizing? Uh, function. By changing what? Uh, how it, where it's like learning. What is it learning? Um, to minimize loss better. But what is it, how does it actually change the function? What changes to say that this function is now better? Theta. This changes theta. Okay, these parameters. Like in the case of our polynomial, it's changing the coefficients. Is this is 3x plus 1 better or is 2.9x plus 0.5 better? Right? And it'll nudge it in a direction. Okay? This theta is also called your parameters. Okay? And what we are learning is parameters. We don't specify the parameters. We specify the function. Uh, we specify the loss function. We specify the optimizer. We got some incoming data and associated labels. And it turns and turns and turns and comes up with a, with a theta. Okay. Questions on it? The, the optimizer we do too. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let's, let's do that one too. We do the optimizer. That's us. Who does theta? Anyone? Yeah. Um, it starts out like random, and then we optimize it. Nolan, right? Yeah. yeah. So the 
the whole system. Uh, uh, <coughs> this, if that makes sense. It's this whole process we're going through to find the thing. Do you really start like, with a uh, random data or are you trying to guess what random. close? Random. There are some, with neural networks, where, where you'll find there are some particular reasons the way it works. Zeros is not good, but random is good. But part of the thing is initializing it sort of well. Uh, uh, and random, and we just don't use any predefined notions. Is there a question here? Yeah. Misha, okay. Yeah. Um, what's supposed to be in that box over there? The box that doesn't have anything in it? Yeah, that's a good question. This uh, was actually, I think, where we put y hat the other day. That's the question. And remind me, Rory? Really? <laughs> All right. Our work is done here. We'll come back on Wednesday. I got that name. Let's see how well I do. All right. So let's look at we've talked about a 10 degree polynomial. Let's go back to just using a 1 degree polynomial. Okay. So f of x equals uh, in x plus b. All right, so our theta consists of uh, your Jake and your Josh. Josh, what's our theta consist of in this case if this is our function? M and D. Yep, okay, so this is theta equals basically the second table of M. It's those values. All right. So we've chosen our f. Let's choose a loss function. If we're trying to, uh, let us hold off on a second. So what we were doing on Wednesday was trying to predict house prices given square footage, I think is what we had as our input, right? So um, given square footage. So. And we were trying to, in fact, fit a line. Okay. That's called linear regression. So basically fit a line to data points so that you can estimate a value given, basically given an input. Okay, where'd this come from? Sir. If it's a Sir, you really need to know his first name. I believe it's James Galton in the 19th century, 1800s. Um, he invented a lot of stuff. So he came up with the so he uh, coined the term median. He came up with the idea of a standard deviation. Okay. Um, and he came up with the idea of linear regression, right? And here's what he was doing. He was looking at the heights of parents as compared to the heights of the children. So here we're going to have parental height. And I don't remember exactly whether it's the average of the um, parent and the child, maybe. Or sorry, the parents. Two parents, one child. And here's the child height. All right, so we can have some, let's say, mean height, which was probably, I don't know, 5'6", five, 5'7", five, at that point, let's say. And this should really be the same distance here, so about like that. So if heights looked about like this, We could fit a line that kind of looks like this. And we could say basically, if you have a parent who's tall, the child will be about as tall. If you have a parent who's mean height, the child will be about mean height. And really, this is probably going to vary a lot more than this. 
Um, and if you have a parent whose height is below the average, then the child will be below average. But this really says, since this is a slope of 1, that it will be the same. right? So if I am pretty far from mean height as a parent, my child's going to be about the same mean height. I don't mean mean height. The same distance from the mean. That's not what he found. What he found was, instead, the slope was less than 1. So mean was about mean, right? So if you have a, if your mean height, your child would be about mean height, roughly, yeah, on average. But if you are at an extreme, let's say here, and this is this distance, your child is not going to be as far from the mean. That is, it's going to regress towards the mean. So we have regression. Towards the mean. And so we have basically kind of like this. So the slope is, I don't know what it is, it's around 0.7, I think, something like that. So if you have a tall parent, you are likely to be less tall than them. On the other hand, if you have a short parent, you're likely to be taller. If the slope were greater than 1, what would that mean? Uh, ben. Ben, Ben. Uh, I mean, that Ben. It mean that you're more extreme than your parent? More extreme than your parent. Which, over time, would actually get to be a big problem, right? You'd have these huge giraffe people and these tiny... Well, I don't know. Anyway, right, that just seems unlikely that that would happen. But yes, that would be progression from the mean as opposed to regression towards the mean. So this regression towards the mean really only captures this particular fact, that our slope is less than 1 and that our, we get less extreme. But the term regression was extended to mean any sort of regression where we basically have some inputs and we're trying to predict an output. And linear regression, in particular, is at this form. Does that make sense? All right. So that's why we have the word regression. Uh, we're still going to have this. Now we have the question, we've got a bunch of points. How do we actually determine? So we have, I don't know, some points like this. How do we determine how good a line is to fit this? We know that something like this would be a not very good line, right? To fit this. And we know that something going kind of along here would be a lot better. How do we want to measure those differences? Anisha. We can like subtract the um, actual and the predictive and square that. Okay, so the actual is along this line along the bottom here. We can take the all of these deltas from here to here. We can square them. Just to like get rid of negatives. That's one way to get rid of the negatives, exactly. And it tends to penalize more extreme ones, mm -hmm. right? And so we could just have a sum of squared error, right? So let's use that as a loss function. Let's say L of x comma y <coughs> equals f of x. We use the same terminology we have over here, y hat minus y squared. Right? That's for a single instance. And if we've got a bunch of instances, sum them. So let's say we sum them. We have six data points here, and we have a certain loss. Um, Matt, if I add a seventh data point, here, just 
thinking about loss. Would you want this loss to go up or down? If I add another one that's closer than any of the others. Uh, down. down kind of makes sense to me. But if we just sum the square differences, it's going to go up. So how could we capture it? Sounds good. So let's basically look at the average square distance. And that's what we'll have here. Does that make sense? Yeah, this is now a batch of x's and y's. Oh, why isn't it y and y Um, the reason is because, right, this is f of x, because we want to capture in L the, the, the function, too, that's coming into here. So we want to just be talking about things in terms of these inputs. That's, that's why we do that. Okay. Does it make, it's a little sloppy in my notation here because I have a single x and y, but really there's a bunch of x's and y's. But let's just ignore that for the moment. Okay, so average squared error. Let's use, so now we have our f, right? That we're using for our linear equations, just a mx plus b. We have a loss function. Let's look at an optimizer. Questions at this point? So, in fact, let's look at this exact case. We have. I don't know, m equals, what does m look like? Anyone? For this line. A little over one, or no, sorry. A little over zero. So it's, m is, let's say, approximately zero, and b is one of these units, right? One, let's say. What is that? b is one. All right. So we know this function well. Let's talk about, by eyeball, optimizing it. Okay? Our goal is not to just look and find the exact best value. We just want to say, like, what direction do we need to go? Should the slope go, I'm going to get rid of this one. Should the slope go up or down? Um, Sally. Um, probably up. Yeah, so a higher slope will lead to lower loss. Does everyone agree? You would disagree? And what about B? Um, maybe a little bit up. We're not thinking little or not little, just up, just down, or stay. stay. Probably. Oh, I agree with you. So higher as well. Let me draw a new one. So if we take the intercept up and the slope up, We might have that. Is the loss going to be higher or lower? It's lower, right? Because basically we're getting rid of all these. <laughs> and now, that was one time through here. We come through again. Our loss function is now lower, which is good. And now we say, OK, what can we do to m and b? And let's look independently. Let's not look at the combination of m and b. Let's just look at b. If we were to take the purple one, and adjust it up or down, adjust the intercept, would we want to increase it or decrease it or keep it the same? Ben? Increase it. Increase it. Sounds good. Okay, now, ignoring the intercept and just looking at the slope, increase, decrease, or stay the same? Increase. Yeah, because if we just moved it up here and kept the same intercept, we'd be decreasing this error. Similarly, if we adjusted the intercept up, it'd decrease the error. And not always, but in this case, if we do both, we're also decreasing it. The problem is, we're doing this by looking at this picture and figuring out what makes sense. And that's not what the computer can do very well. Right? So 
Um, how did we know? How did we know that increasing the intercept would decrease the loss? Another way to think about it is let's go to a simpler problem for a moment. Okay? Because what we've got here, this loss function, has two parameters that we're adjusting, right? The M and the B. So what's of interest to us is two different the way we're looking at it is those are variables, right? The X and the Y are like constants, sort of, but the the M and the B are variables in this. And so we've got this multivariable problem. Let's go to a single variable problem, because I can't write a multivariable on the screen well. So in a single variable problem, let's say we have this quadratic, and we are trying to minimize it. So this is, let's say, L or loss. Um, this could happen if we had you know, a bunch of, we're trying to separate two different kinds of things, squares and x's, and we want to find the right place along the line to say that's where we want to separate them. That would be this kind of, we could have this kind of a loss, where it's just one thing that's changing, and we have a value for it. So let's say we're here, and we're trying to get to a minimum. Which direction do we go? Nick's not here. Willow. Yeah, well, for x, if we're talking about changing x. So x can go higher or lower. Yeah, so, so to the left. How do you know that? Let's say you don't have a picture here. I tell you, here's a function l, and we've got, and actually this isn't really x. We'll make this be. Uh, theta, our single parameter, right? And this is the value of the loss function. So this is L of theta here, right? So theta is the thing we're modifying. We might think of it as, for instance, the intercept. So we can make the intercept bigger and smaller, and that'll change the loss. How do you know, if you didn't have a picture of this, that you wanted to go left? Could you, like, incrementally increase and decrease it in other directions, see what, like, the output is? Okay, so... I like that idea. So you could, well, I don't know whether I want to get it bigger or smaller, so let me make it a little bigger and see what happens to the loss. Or make it a little smaller and see what happens to the loss and pick the one that reduces the loss. Sounds good to me. That will work. It's expensive, though, because if we have 10,000 parameters, we've got to 10,000 times go move it up a little bit, move it down a little bit, and check and see, and then separately move up, move down. That's expensive. So is there some analytical way we can do this? <coughs> and let's say we were on this side, as opposed to this side. On this one, we want to go to the right. On this one, we want to go to the left, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you some guidelines here and see if that helps. This is one guideline. That is an ugly looking guideline. Let's just kind of fix this so that it's more. Boy, that's really bad. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of like this. And we've got, we'll say that we're here. And here's one guideline there. And here's a guideline here. Okay, so look at the derivative of that point, which is really just the limit as you are adding little deltas, right, to see what it changes. So basically this says, this derivative says if you increase x, the derivative of the slope is negative, and so therefore the uh, f or L of x, it's really theta, right, L of theta will increase. Whereas here, the slope is positive, so L of theta will the slope is positive. It says if you increase it, it'll increase the value. So therefore, we want to decrease it. 
This one says if you increase, it'll decrease the value, so we want to increase it. Okay. I guess my one question was when you said there's no picture, but there is a function, right? There is a function. Okay. You just, you're just imagining a case where you don't have a graph with it. Right? We don't have a graph, exactly. Because we're going to be multi dimensional and everything else. We don't have a graph. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I was trying to say, um, so theta has actually two variables. In Natto, this is a different problem here. Okay? We, we have a simplification because here, theta has two values. And I can't draw in three dimensions. Some people can, but I can't. Yeah, so like, yeah. Simpler problem, we're just saying we have a two-dimensional loss. And therefore, we can see the derivative. Yeah, so in higher dimensions, how do we like, define this slope we have here? We will get to that. Great question. So nice segue, or nice leading question. But does this one make sense? So basically, we don't really look at the graph, right? I'm not looking. I promise, I'm not looking. I've got a theta, so I've got a theta, and in this simple example, I'm moving it left to right. Do I want to move it left to right? I will take the derivative of what function? The loss function, right? L. We have this function. What we don't have is the underlying distribution of the training data, but we have our loss function because we wrote it. The loss function includes in it a reference to f, but we wrote that too. Right? We know what that is. And so therefore, we can take d theta, sorry, dl, d theta. Does theta show up explicitly in L? No. Where is theta? It's in f, right? So we could just say dl d theta equals dl d f, right? Chain rule times df d theta. Okay. If this is our loss function, can we take the derivative of it with respect to f? Please say yes. Yes. If you take the derivative, it would be like 2, the, the summation of 2 times y hat minus y divided by Can we take the derivative of f with respect to theta? We're going to design stuff so we can. Okay? And certainly, if f is this type, can we find the derivative of f with respect to b? What is it? So I'm going to uh, df db. Um, it's one. This one. And this is not really fair because we have two parameters here. So really it's a partial derivative. So let's fix that. Partial f. Partial. I'm kind of proud, I think, of how well that's been done. Of partial b equals one. And what about partial f? Partial m. derivatives are kind of easy, right? Because anything doesn't have an m in it, throw it away. So the derivative of m x with respect to m. Yeah. Yeah. She says very certainly x. And she's correct. Which is good, because if she had a slightest hesitation, it might not have been correct, but it was. So we were going to be using derivative of the loss function with respect to each of the parameters in theta to determine which way to move them. Right? If the derivative is positive, that says if we increase the parameter, what happens to the loss? <coughs> Morgan? So if we have a positive derivative, that means if we increase that parameter, what happens to the loss? Plus and minus. So do we want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So if the derivative is positive, we want to go the other way. And if the derivative is negative, 
like in this case, then if we increase, what we get? The parameter, what's going to happen to loss? Concept makes sense. All right, there's a term for this. It's called gradient descent. So, um, gradient descent Here's the picture. You're in a, you're on a mountain, okay? And it's all foggy too. And you're trying to get off the mountain down the valley. But it's all foggy, and you can't see anything and you don't have GPS, right? You can't tell what to do. So the question is, what direction do you go? Down. That's where you descent. Go down. You don't know if that's the direction to actually get to the valley exactly, but you know you're going to be have less altitude if you go in a down direction in your local area that you're looking at than going the same or up. And you might get messed up. How might you get messed up? Sometimes this is very profound. Sometimes you need to go up, go down, right? which is true. You might get stuck, right? And we're going to talk about sort of getting stuck in. So let's say you have looking at two dimensional in here. So let's say you have a right something like that. Our global minimum is here. If we're not careful, we might get stuck in a, in a local minimum. And the other thing we'll do, if it's a very um, shallow slope, we'll go a little bit. And if it's a steep slope, we'll go more. So we're going to use not only the direction of the derivatives, but their value to determine how much to move. All right, a gradient. So if we take the derivative, single variable derivative, you know, df, dx, <coughs> or dl d theta, or whatever, we get out if we have if we want to evaluate this for a particular x, right? A, a value, a scalar value. Right? The slope is one or 0.5 or negative two or whatever. However, if you have, let's say L, and you have a collection of thetas, do you get a single value out right, if you're evaluating this at some particular theta? So this is a, a, a vector of parameters. Another way to think of it is when we calculated the slope here of f with respect to m and with respect to b, we got different values, right? If we were looking at a particular x like 5, what would the derivative be for b? Any one? No, zero. Oh, gf to b is 1. And m, if x is 5, 5, right? And if we had a different x, it would be a different value. Well, we, how many values do we get for slope? Two. 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 One for B, one for M. So when you have a vector of values, you get out a vector of slopes called a gradient. So slopes, which are just partial derivatives. So you could think of it, you're sitting on the top of the hill, the mountain, right? We're in three dimensions, because the world is three dimensional. And so we might take the derivative with respect to north-south, right? That direction, and east-west. 
and we get a slope in one direction and a slope in another direction. And we could use the combination of those to determine where to go. Okay, so if we're sloping down in the north direction and down in the east direction, let's go northeast. Make sense? Uh, Okay. Had a cheat. Oh, here it is. Let me just see what I want to. All right. So here's what we'll do. Let's go ahead and take this partial derivative. We took the partial derivative of f with respect to m b. Let's look now at the partial derivative of L with respect to F, which was right here, right? So L is, I'm going to look at one instance right now, one training example, OK? So it is F of x minus y squared. Yes? Partial L with respect to partial F. Um, That's Leo. <laughs> By process of elimination, I can't find Leo. So, <laughs> so what's the derivative of L with respect to F? Um, um, like two F, uh, two F of X. Okay. Not quite, because it's two times F of X minus Y. Yeah. Okay. Just like if we have f of x equals x minus 3 squared, right? 2 times x minus 3. Leo, you, you, you've got to avoid this one. Oh, nice. Your name came up. Oh. And I was scanning. Like, <laughs> Leo, I think I know him. Anyway, um, so we got this 2 times f of x minus y. We <coughs> also call it f of x what? Another name for f of x? Y. So well, let's look at this one. Okay. This instance right here. This is x equals 5 and f of x, sorry, y equals 4. And let's calculate the green. So Everyone agree where, where we are? We're right here in this, right? We're in the optimizer, and we're going to be basically using the gradient to update data. So, the derivative of the loss with respect to B is the derivative of the loss with respect to f times the derivative of f with respect to b. This is 1, right? This is 2 times f of x minus y times 1. So this equals f of x. Oh, we don't know what f of x is, do we? Let's come up with an n and a b uh, for the purple line. M looks like 0.2 to me. And b so 0.2 times 5 is 1 plus 3 quarters, let's say. That doesn't make sense because our intercept is right here. So that's one. Yes? And so f of x equals 0.2 times x. Right, so we're interested in x equals 
5, I said, and y equals 4. Right? That's this one right here. And what's f of x equal? Um, Leo. Um, so f of x equals 0.2x plus 1. Therefore? Yeah. Um, so we get 0.2x plus 1. Yeah, but x is 5. So let's oh, just plug okay. it all in. Uh, so 1 plus 1. So we get 4. Or 2 and then times 2. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What I heard is 1 plus 1, so 4. <laughs> uh, 2 minus, but I see where you are. So equals um, uh, 4, 8, right? Yeah. So that means if we increase m, what happens to the loss? Well, I'm not like this yet. Hold on a second. Help me out here. I think it's one minus the square. Yeah, the square one. Oh, I just threw in a square. Oh, thank goodness. All right, so two minus four is negative two. The negative four. All right, Leo. This says that if you increase m, what happens to the loss? Um, it becomes negative. It becomes lower, lower, right? So if you increase m by one unit, the loss goes down by four units. Yeah. All right. And. The difference here is going to be, instead of a 1 here, this is going to be a x, right, which is 5. So this is going to equal minus 20. So increasing the slope by one unit should increase the, decrease the loss by 20 units. So on Wednesday, we'll actually now use these to adjust the phase. But we know the direction we, know, we want to go, and we know the relative magnitudes that we want to move. Now we need to decide actually how much to move there. Any questions? All right. I have office hours right after this. Where? Wait, we have till 2.30. Forget this. Forget Wednesday. Here we go. <laughs> We're going into adjusting theta. Questions so far? So everyone see how we have determined that we want to increase b. And we've determined we want to increase m. And we also know that increasing m will decrease the loss more than increasing b. Because the slope is more negative. Right? We decided this one is minus 4, and this one is minus 20. So here's one thing we could do. We could just say b is going to equal b minus, uh, which direction would be though, up or down? Yeah. Up. So I'm going to call it for now minus minus 4, OK? Because basically, I'm just taking the slope, taking the derivative, and subtracting it from the theta. So I had a question. Why did we pick a single point? Wouldn't we want to use all the points? Oh. Yes, we probably do want to use all the points. It was just simpler to calculate here. What we really would do is take the derivative of each of these and then take the average. Okay. Okay. So that would be the better way to do it. Basically, what we're doing is we're fixing it for this one, but we may be making it worse for the others. We would be better off looking at the derivative for each of them taking the average and going in that direction. And m, how would we change m? Math. Sorry, math. Um, you would already calculate them. Yeah, so we just do, well, not. If we're going to move this one minus 4, how much do we want to move in? Um, negative 20. By negative 20. Decrease it by negative 20. Does this, do we think this is going to do us good? This is like 
huge changes, right? This is basically, if we were trying to do gradient descent on this, this says we're here, well, let's go a thousand this way, right? Because we know that's the right direction. So, baby steps. That's what we're gonna do, right? Baby steps. We do like this direction, and we like these, the, the relative changes here. We do want to do M by five times more than we want to do B. But we want to uh, <coughs> dampen this. So we are going to put in here a lambda. This one's better than this one. The loss here is less than the loss here, in my mind, for my lambdas. But in any case, um, so lambda is the learning rate. How fast do you go? We might use 0.0001, for example. Who determines lambda? Yes. So Ben determines lambda. Now, we determine lambda just like we determine f. We determine. So, but it's not called a parameter. Because when we say parameter, we mean one thing. We mean one of the thetas that controls f. And this doesn't affect our, con it doesn't affect what f is. It doesn't affect the coefficients we want to end up with, right? It just affects how we get there, Rory. Um, so then they're going to change the world, or is it going to stay? Uh, that's a good question. So you can have a learning schedule where you are adjusting lambda as you go. Would you think you would want higher lambdas at the beginning or the ending of your training? At the beginning, right? You want to make large jumps. And part of what those large jumps will do is jump you over those local minima, minima right? To get you possibly to higher. But if you keep going with a large learning rate, you might skip over this, and then you might just keep kind of going back and forth here and here and here, and never make it down. So that's a great question, and yes, we often do want to reduce the learning rate over time. We have a name for lambda. It is a hyper parameter. Okay. One of the choices that you are making in setting up your system. Uh, I guess if you're stretching things, it could in some way. If you're going to say that, then the choice of the loss function is also a hyperparameter. Um, it is one of your choices. But we tend to um, reserve the hyperparameters for values that affect either the loss or the optimization. Okay, the lambdas are the same for both B and F. Yeah, we're going to use the same on this because we, we want. So that's a good question, though. In the future, it, and there are reasons why we might want to say, let's use a different learning rate for one of these parameters as opposed to another parameter. So we could have uh, parameter specific learning rates. Um, and we will get to that. I'm not saying it's hard topic. Um, <clears throat> don't you have to deal with. I mean, doesn't that like increase like the dimensionality of your problem, but like exponentially, if you're like having these different conditional like learning rates at that point, especially if you're dealing with like super small ones for uh, one and then or for multiple of your parameters uh, you're trying to adjust? Well, we're not going to change it by hand. Okay. We're going to have some mechanism, some policy that actually will adjust them on the fly. You know, give you kind of a preview of a few weeks from now. Uh, if you've got something that is just continually going down and down and down and down, let's increase its learning rate. But if you have something that's going back and forth, down and up and down and up, let's reduce the learning rate. That's kind of the concept. So it is you, you do want it to be conditional on like the loss. You do want to see like how it's doing the loss and then determine your learning rate from there. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you would probably be looking at how is the gradient changing over time. Okay. Okay. A, ways, a ways from now. For now, let's just think of it as a single fixed learning rate, but it's one of the things you need and there will be a variety of different hyperparameters. This is one of the problems in, in, in deep learning. 
is how do you find the right hyperparameters? If your learning rate is too high, you're not going to get to a lot of loss. If your learning, learning rate is too low, often a lot of this will just take forever. Um, and so that's one of the things one has to do is kind of search for the right hyperparameters. And unfortunately, since we have more than one of them probably, you have this multi-dimensional problem that you're trying to solve. In order to control this multi-dimensional problem that you're trying to learn, um, and so um, Ezra. yeah. So, if you had a learning rate that was too small, um, would you also struggle to get through the local minimum? That is also the case. You can struggle to get through the local minimum. However, there's a way around this, and that is if we take the entire set of training examples. I don't remember who asked this question, um, but uh, it was you. Instead of, that, instead of really just looking at one, we should be looking at all of them. If we look at all of them, then it will tell us for the entire set of training examples what's the right direction to go okay. for each of the parameters. Is there any uh, Jack, sorry, I wasn't here for the last class. So I just heard the class. Uh, I would Did you add, actually? And you added? I wasn't able to add. Uh, informally accepted, but I wasn't able to add. Okay, and the reason for that is <laughs> I gave it out to two people, kind of first come, first serve. Um, but we'll talk afterwards. Okay, okay so yeah, go ahead. Um, so clearly it seems like you don't want to look at one point, uh, and I think we just look at all of them generally. Is there ever any case where maybe you want to look at, you know? Uh, yes, great question. I'm just getting there. Sure. So here we go. I mean, no, it's a perfect segue. So you could look at all these. In which case, it's a deterministic process, right? We go through, we look at all of them, we calculate the loss, we calculate the gradients in each of them, we move in that direction according to the learning rate. And let's just finish this, right? If we actually use lambda of this, then b is going to change from 1 to uh, 1.0004, right? And m is going to change from, what do you say, 0.2? 0.2 to 0.2. O, O, 2, O. What's going to happen to our loss? It's going to be down by a little bit. And we'll run through it again and again and again. But if we're doing the entire batch, it is a completely deterministic process. Okay, if we don't have any randomness anywhere else. However, we can add some randomness. And so we get, instead of gradient descent, Stochastic gradient descent. Which you'll sometimes see written as S G E. Okay. So the stochastic part is we're gonna have some randomness in this. And the randomness is, at its extreme case, instead of taking the entire set of training instances, we're gonna take one training instance and we're gonna go through our loop here of feeding it in, feeding it F, finding the loss, going through, running our optimizer, updating M and B. And then we'll do another one. How do we choose the next one randomly? So we'll basically take all this, all this set of training instances, and every time, choose one. Okay. With or without replacement. If it's without replacement, when you're finished, that's called a single batch, and you go through a single epoch, and you go through and do it again. Is there always one, or could it be some larger subset? So the choices are, I talked about the entire size of the training set, and now I'm talking about one. And yes, and, and really what we do is in the middle. What we do is batches. Okay. But this came about, uh, <coughs> the question, I think Ezra, you had the part about getting stuck. Mm -hmm. So one way you can avoid getting stuck is with a higher learning rate. Another way is this stochasticity. Right? You may be choosing a particular training example that tells you to go um, far in this direction, let's say. Mm -hmm. okay? Because it may have a very high derivative. Whereas other ones, most of the other ones might have low derivatives, which are going to cause you to get stuck. So if you looked at the entire set of them together, you're stuck in here. But if you look at a single one of them, it, it, it may shoot you way over here because it'll have a much higher derivative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And that, that's part of what makes the gradient descent works, is this stochasticity. Um, because 
it seems like we should just get stuck in local minimum. And in practice, we don't tend to. Part of it depends on the function space we have, and it just turns out for neural networks, we, we, we don't. It kind of, it just works um, for reasons that are not really quite clear. Um, one reason might be that there are a lot of local minima, but they're pretty close to each other, so it doesn't matter whether we're here or here. Um, last questions. So what we're gonna do though is take a batch. Let's just talk about that batch. So this is mini batch. Usually when we say batch, we mean entire batch of training examples. We're gonna use a mini batch. We might have, let's say, 10,000 training examples. 10K training examples. And we might say 256 batch size. So that means we'll take our 10K, we'll randomize them, and then we'll take the first 256, the next 256, the next 256, the next 256, until we're done. Right? The last batch, may, mini batch, may be smaller than the others. And then we go through randomizing again for our next epoch. So we do multiple epochs, and then multiple mini batches per epoch. And when we talk about what we're doing here, we're going through that whole loop of evaluating x, evaluating loss, computing the gradient, updating the gradient. One advantage of doing it this way is, right to begin with, the um, gradient is random. Sorry, not the gradient, the parameters are random. And so we're doing all this computation on the gradient on our, on our random parameters. We could probably determine the direction to go with a much smaller set. So it'll be slow, faster to go. What, what defines the epoch? What the number of epochs, how long do you keep training? Okay. You know, we could call that. What could we call that? Uh, what kind of a thing is it? Is it a parameter? Well, hyperparameter. It's a hyperparameter. So we have two new hyperparameters. What are they? Number of epochs and batch size. More things to try and figure out. Now we'll see you on Wednesday, sorry. I will be in the cafe for the next hour.